Did they show up for you, Amanda? I don't see record. <laughs> so if it did, I didn't oh. see it. <laughs> Mine says we're, we're good. We're good oh, to go. It's okay. Recording. Okay. All right. Hello. Hello. Welcome to um, Hygiene Elevated Conversations and Innovations. Um, you are joining us for our podcast tonight. We are interviewing Kristen Pristovec. Did I say that correct? We could just go with Kristen Hunter. That's a okay. lot easier to pronounce. Okay. <laughs> Savic, though, uh, is my maiden name. Kristen Hunter. Um, so to begin with, Kristen, I'm going to kind of give you the floor. Tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. your journey um, becoming a dental hygienist and your background. You're doing laser training instruction. I am. So my beginnings in dentistry really started when I was like 11 years old. I used oh, wow. to go with my neighbor. I would babysit her dogs. And so she was an office manager. So I'd go to work with her sometimes and help file. Um, and then I started as a dental assistant when I was about 17 years old. And then, you know, went into hygiene school and everything and practiced as a hygienist. Um, since about 2008 was when I entered into my hygiene program. So that was in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and then kind of progressed to having an interest in, in lasers and the education. Um, I've always really liked teaching. Um, I used to do CPR courses and instruct those. Um, when I was younger, I would always volunteer to help younger kids um, with their reading skills because I was always a really good reader. So I think I've always kind of had a bit of a natural teacher. And as hygienists, you know, we're wanting and, you know, we give instruction all day long to our patients. I mean, we're, we're, we're teachers, every one of us. Mm -hmm. I love hearing everybody's intro into the dental world and what interests them. And so I, I don't think we've heard anybody um, ha come from their neighbor was an office manager. Yeah. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> Well, we all get our hooks in dentistry somehow. So. <laughs> yeah. So where are you based out of? So I live in Forney, Texas. So we're just a little southeast of Dallas, Texas. So, um, yep, we live in live in Texas. Okay, perfect. So what inspired you to specifically go into laser dentistry? Well, I think it just comes down to red light therapy and how beneficial wavelengths and lasers just are for your overall health. Like personally, um, you know, I've always had laser treatments for my skin. Um, I, I really think that they're great for your overall health. There's a lot of studies and research behind how it accelerates healing in the human body and then using them in dentistry. Um, I've just really seen a huge benefit to my patients health wise. Um, it makes their appointments a lot more comfortable sometimes in some scenarios, depending on how you're using the, it and what application. Um, so I really just kind of developed an interest in that and it, and it kind of extends into my personal life as well and involving lasers and different ways of using them for personal health and just regeneration. That, that is awesome. And I totally agree with you. I'm hearing more and more like red light therapy. I honestly never even put the two together. Hello. That makes, that makes total sense. So that's, that is an interesting thought. Now, um, Kristen, um, Amanda did clue me in that you're a big fan of muffins and mimosas. Yeah. So I also, um, along with laser training, we, I have a study club that I kind of started with a really good friend of mine. Her name is Candace Swartout. Um, she's a speaker and she's an educator, educator herself. She's a second year uh, clinic coordinator at a hygiene school. And um, we kind of just met during COVID. I think we met online, like in a Facebook hygiene group. And we did a Zoom call because no one was allowed to be near each other. And we just kind of hit it off. And then um, we had an idea. We're like, what if we just do this little, you know, event that's very intimate and personal um, and kind of invite great speakers and uh, muffins and mimosas kind of came, came from that. What kind of venues do you have your study clubs at? I'm just curious. So we like to go for um, intimate settings. We cap our attendance. Um, so we want everyone not to like feel that you show up and you got lost in a crowd. 
So we go with more intimate settings to kind of give our attendees a feeling of like, you know, it's, it's kind of a way to hang out with your girlfriends too, because I think a, high, a lot of hygienists were moms and we're super busy and we wanted to form an event where people could more so socialize and then earn um, CE at the same time. Yeah. That's really that. neat. Yeah. Amal, could that be our next venture, Joffrey? <laughs> Some study clubs? Maybe. I don't know how muffins and mimosas would do in Utah. We'll have to do like swig and I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> Every, they're obsessed with soda up here. It's it's so bizarre. So oh. bizarre to me. I've spent a lot of time in Salt Lake City, so I love Utah. It's beautiful. Um, I used to vacation at Lake in Lake Powell every year as a kid growing up. So okay. I love Utah. Being from Arizona, we went there quite often. Yeah, it's a cool space. So what other current ventures are you doing? I mean, you're dabbling in a, a quite a bit. I mean, lasers are like a hot button topic. Like everybody's finally getting on board with lasers. So how busy does that keep you? Um, very busy. So we're doing events, you know, any day of the week. Um, but you mentioned other ventures. This is not dental related, but, um, I watch dogs. Uh, my husband and I, we actually have a dog boarding business. Um, and okay. so we, um, get to take care of people's fur babies when they leave on vacation. Um, so that's another venture we kind of have. And I love spending time with the dogs and, then lasers keeps me super busy traveling and, um, you know, training offices. And we also do just other continuing education events. Like we did one in Reno called peak performance. Um, so we like to just provide great CE for dental professionals and really arrange dynamic speakers for people to get their CEs from, but lasers, dogs, and, uh, muffins and mimosas is, is what keeps me busy. Your neighbor, your childhood neighbor really had a big impact on you. I know, yeah. She, I remember her dogs too. They were big, great Danes, uh, Zeus and Marley. So, yeah. So is your dog business out of your home or do you have a place? Well, uh, we have some uh, property. So we did build, um, my husband came up with the concept. It's um, like a barn. So it's called Bodark Grange. Um, in this area, we have a lot of Bodark trees. And my husband, he's part French. And Bodark, the way that they spell, it's a French word. Um, so anyways, came up with that concept. Um, but it is like a home environment. They have bedrooms that they sleep in. So there's no cages. There's no kennels. Um, it's open free play. So all the dogs, um, are out. We have a pond, um, they have about an acre or so fenced off where they run. So we try to make it where your dog doesn't feel like they got put away for the, you know, yes. on vacation. They're on their own vacation here too. That's, I love that. I have dogs. I have two dogs and it is always so critical for me to get a house sitter when we go somewhere because they stress, they, they definitely stress. And my husband he doesn't quite get it. He's like, can't we just leave them, like give them food and like leave the dog door? I'm like, they're going to stress. They know. They yeah. know we're gone. So yeah, exactly. That's a that's an interesting um, just dynamic that you guys have, but that that's works that, well for you. That's a left turn from dentistry for sure. <laughs> so do that's you practice? Just the, oh. oh, I was going to say, that's just the entrepreneur in you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Always looking for that next thing. What are we going to do? What's next? But so Amanda, you, that was a great question. Are you um, practicing in the clinical setting right now? So um, not at this current moment um, with our CE training and lasers, you know, it's, it's keeping us very busy. We go to all 50 states right now. So um, anywhere that people need training, we're, we're available to come. Um, and then you mentioned, and I'm using my train of thought right now. Um, what did, what was your question again? If you're practicing clinically, oh, I think yes. it was my own. So, super busy with laser training. Um, I do volunteer. I did an event a couple months ago for human trafficking victims. Um, we were serving a group of women who had been rescued from human trafficking. Mm -hmm. So um, if I practice clinic, it's more in that type of a setting than clocking in and clocking out as a hygienist. Uh, definitely worthwhile. There's no shortage of that need right now. So that's awesome. I love that, Kristen, that you have all of these 
um, avenues and different communities that you're a part of, but you're still so grounded with your hygiene community and paying it forward and helping others. Yeah, trying to, and I'm sure you women can relate. You just came from probably your full-time job working Joffrey and jumped on this call. So I know that you guys can definitely relate to the entrepreneurial spirit and kind of always developing new and different things and um, kind of giving back to the, the hygiene community from what you also know. I would agree with that. Yeah. Hygiene definitely has a little piece of my heart. It, I just love it. <laughs> um, Kristen, I'm very interested to find out, like, what did the process look like in the timeline to get your um, AGD PACE certification? So um, that can be a bit of an individual answer. I mean, for me, I think we developed and spent time working on that for almost a year. But, you know, some people may take them longer, um, but really just kind of reading, making sure that you're in line with what they're requesting. And, you know, beyond AGD PACE, we also work with the Academy of Laser Dentistry. So um, being able to provide top quality education by partnering with other agencies um, has helped us with, with um, the value behind our program and what every clinician walks away with and earning, you know, some type of certification or some type of CE credit. That's so cool. I feel like the last 10 years, they've really finally opened up the ability and the accessibility of like smaller in-person CE events like this, where it's not, you have to go to like your big annual conference. So things like muffins and mimosas and in-office trainings are so much more convenient. And I feel like you learn so much more because you're already like in the mode, you're in the setting, or you're intentionally wanting to go to something. So. And that's, I completely agree with you. That's a lot of what we're seeing is, you know, especially with um, dentistry, a lot of offices being a part of a larger organization and they want to organize CE for their staff because when you have 70 offices within a few states, you know, a lot of these larger agencies are then organizing events for just their staff to attend. So CE credits are not only earned at these big annual conferences that we were so used to seeing. And for me, you know, getting out of hygiene school, the conference I would always go to was, you know, in San Francisco every year, and you'd earn everything that you needed in a three day period. Um, but now we definitely see a whole variety of, of ways to get your CEs and in office, small group settings, um, via zoom, you know, there's all these different ways that people can now access their education. Yeah. It's not so much drinking from a fire hose in a three day time period. Yeah. <laughs> end of it you're like what did I learn today I don't know because it's just yeah. so much information and there's a lot of content in every hour you spend listening to somebody yeah well I think we're gonna switch segue a little bit and focus more on lasers Joffrey do you want to dive in on the laser questions I do okay so I have worked <laughs> with like array of lasers Kristen and I want to know, like, in your opinion or your expertise, does the price of the laser impact the quality of care? Gosh, there is so many different lasers and there can be specific ways that you use them to treat someone where maybe a specific laser is great for this procedure, but not good for another one. As far as price and, and quality, go. I think it's with anything that you buy in life. You know, if you purchase something that is a very budget friendly item, sometimes it doesn't last as long or it doesn't give you like all the bells and whistles that something that maybe was at a higher price point. Um, and then as far as clinical care, clinical outcome, that's going to be dependent on the person treating the individual and that individual's like systemic health, how they're going to respond to treatment. So I think it's a combination of things. Um, but that's, you know, you can get, get a great product that is budget friendly or spend a ton of money on a laser and still be able to use both of those in, in patient care and get good results. I mean, it totally makes sense. You get what you pay for all mm -hmm. the time. I mean, I've had experiences working with like, uh, 
very expensive DECA CO2 laser and then one that was much less expensive like diode laser. Do you have, do you see big differences in your results versus the CO2 versus the diode? Well, you just treat each patient differently. Um, and again, I feel like the patient response is so very personalized. My wow. carbon dioxide laser, because of how we systemically treated them, meaning like not whole body, I mean, it's all connected, but um, we had regimented appointments in a specific way that we treated individuals with our CO2. And then with our diodes, we did things a little different. So my clinical outcome, I think with CO2, sometimes we're um, immediately better because I saw them so much and the way that we treated them with the CO2 was very different than what we did with our diode. But I started with the diode. I'm lucky enough. And, you know, it sounds like you've been able to use a DECA as well. They're, you know, CO2s are great lasers for your hygiene applications, but, um, I have a favorite laser kind of for everything. What if only we your... had a, Oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I have so many questions. I know, I know. I'm just thinking, if only I had a shelf of many lasers in my operatory, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I wish I had. <laughs> I wish we all had that luxury, oh, actually. Yeah. Um, and I, I think you're right, Kristen. When I was working with the CO2 laser, I was seeing my patients so frequently. And I was also like grilling them on their home care every single time I got to see them. So they got like the hygiene lecture every relays appointment. Um, and I, I, when I practice with the, um, diode laser, I'm not seeing them as frequently. So I guess I want to kind of jump in and ask, what would you say is the recommended flow? Like if we're going to do scaling and root planning with a diode laser, what would be like the ideal treatment plan? That was going to be my question. Like, what are the recall frequencies that you use with the laser? So, well, again, it depends on the patient, kind of the severity of the disease and what you're seeing. We would have kind of like everything we would recommend, you know, and if you were more of a, you know, type three or stage three perio, we're going to say, do all of these things. We want to see you this often versus if we have a stage one, we might say, you know what, we can just do the two quads and your two quads and we'll see you in four to six weeks for reeval where sometimes if we had a more extensive periodontally involved person we would recommend maybe seeing them more frequently we would um, maybe treat them per quad instead of doing two at a time so it really would be individualized um, per the patient um, but if I had a severe individual I'd give them everything like this is the gold standard treatment plan this is what we really want to see from you or see you doing to get you back to some point of health. Um, and then kind of your patient, everyone maybe can't afford to come in as many times as you're recommending or have the transportation to get there. So very, very patient and individualized when it comes to kind of that treatment planning stage. Joffrey, you were telling me about an office that you worked at um, where you would do scaling and root planing and laser therapy with SRP. And that's, that's my standard as well. But you would see them every week, I believe. Um, it was. Every two weeks, they would every come in and weeks. we would do a, I mean, we weren't probing the tissue because it's right. way too early to do that. But we right. were like just visually examining the tissue, pointing out areas that they needed to hit harder with their home care. And then um, relazing that area. Yeah. What is the standard, like when you were talking about, Kristen, um, your initial, like the dream treatment plan well, for your class? Or three. that type three patient, right? Yeah. What does that look like? How many recare well, lasers are they getting? How many what was that? How many times, like, would you say like they t you would plan that they would need to come in for laser? Maximum, we would plan for six appointments where okay. we would treat specific areas at each appointment. And kind of the biggest thing is just reinforcing your home care. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, you have a lot more visits to kind of hammer home, like this is what you're doing. And um, this is how you should be doing it. In those patients that you spend so much time with, you really feel like you develop like a friend at the end and you really feel like you have, or, you know, I felt like they were my partner and I hope they felt that same way too. Like we're working together to get them back to like 
some form of health, but we usually included some sort of, um, we recommended, you know, saliva testing. We would mm -hmm. usually do a carrier tray. Um, we would have, I'm, I'm a friend of carries free like rinses and things. Sometimes we would say, Hey, let's do your A and B rinses. If you guys are familiar with that product, the A and B rinse does not taste very good, but it works wonders in the mouth. Um, so we would sometimes go with a rest in and pair that also with our laser therapy. Um, but we usually had several adjuncts we could offer for patients to, um, to, to utilize, to help them get back to a certain point of health. I do like having so many like arrows in the quiver. When you see that patient, yeah. like I don't recommend chlorhexidine hardly at all anymore, but there's still cases where I'm like, you know, I think this would be good. But having like the option of doing, you know, a perio protect or, you know, whatever extra things that you want to do, the arrest and so on and so forth. Um, it, it is always nice to have those options to really treat the patient where, you know, like we are throwing everything possible at this patient to address this inflammation. And kind of what you mentioned, like just having a lot of things, my husband calls it throwing spaghetti at the wall and you just see what, <laughs> see what sticks. sticks. Cause, <laughs> so you may have someone who is like, all right, I'll wear my pair protect trays, but you better, you know, I'm not testing saliva, you know, like they'll go towards it or even with home care, you know, they'll use a water pick, but they for sure will never put anything in between their teeth, you know, and it's just finding these things that people will adapt, whether it's yeah. a habit or something that they'll accept from you in the office. It's just trying to find those things that those patients are comfortable with, they can afford, um, and they're committed to doing themselves as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Whenever patients ask me like, what is the best thing that's on the market right now? I'm like, the best thing is whatever you're going to use. Yeah. <laughs> My opinion matters a little bit, but what you're yeah. actually going to use on a daily, that's that's the key. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Kristen, I want to go back. I love that you had said placing a rest in with laser therapy. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I mean, our next question was going to be talking about some misconceptions, but I feel like um, it's kind of a this or that, you know, like we could have a rest in or laser. And I love that you just said you can actually treatment plan and deliver those simultaneously. Yeah. I mean, not at the same time, but one right after the other. So you would go through with your laser first you know, there's no contraindication to place an antibiotic in the pocket following laser therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, it's up to the patient and that clinician is that the best route of action, but you definitely wouldn't want to place that in and then go through with that laser, you know, following placement of a Restin or a perio chip or anything like that. That is a neat idea. Hmm. I haven't, I haven't honestly thought of that. Um, Kristen, any other misconceptions that you see often with when it comes to implementing laser therapy? Um, that I don't have time. That's one for sure. I think it's a lot of time orientation. Like I don't have time for that. Or, um, you know, we there are articles and research that, you know, show positive um, influence of the biofilm with your laser. So then there's that misconception of, well, they don't work. Um, mm -hmm. so having, you know, you've got time as a factor or just the misconception, um, that lasers aren't proven yet. Gosh. Um, I'll ask the question on behalf of hygienists that have a very ancient laser, like probably, I probably have like the great grandfather of lasers still effective. I have a Fox okay. laser and trying to find even a user's manual on Google is next to impossible. <laughs> what what um, advice do you have for hygienists that maybe kind of got thrown into a laser that they weren't familiar with and haven't um, been able to find resources online? Fortunately, I was able to find Angie Wallace and ask her. I hunted her down and asked her about my laser. But what would you say for hygienists that were in that situation and don't have that resource? So you would just go back to critical thinking and what you learned from your training and knowing, you know, kind of what your power level should be, of course, with any procedure, start really low. If you're like, well, I don't know what the recommended setting would be for this laser, 
think about the wavelength that you have, look at your tissue and see, you know, how dark it is, how much of your chromophore is present. And then just kind of thinking back to your training where, you know, you're taught to start low um, for your procedures. And then, you know, depending on what you're doing, maybe you want your laser pulsing and maybe you want it in your continuous wave. So um, just kind of thinking back to training and, you know, in training, you should have learned some type of physics concepts um, and concepts surrounding safe settings. So just kind of thinking back to that training portion um, and understanding the wavelength that you're working with is very important when kind of trying to figure out, okay, what setting to go to. As far as um, laser units go, the diode unit, very most of them pretty easy to figure out. A lot of them have these preset settings. You just turn them on. Um, they'll tell you what the procedures are. You can select that procedure. Um, and if you're unsure, just maybe go to that preset and then just lower it from there, you know, and then uh, titrate that energy back up based on your tissue response. Oh, those are very good, very good points. It does always come back to like, think critically, think logically yeah. if you don't have but those. So it's not, you, know, you don't want to say like, oh, I have this brand. How do I use the brand? It's how do you use a laser? Just yeah. how do you use that laser? You know, well, that's awesome. I like that, that, that mindset. Mm -hmm. um, so Kristen, um, you and I spoke a while back on the phone and I've really been thinking about how hygiene elevated and dedicated hygienists have a common thing where here where we're both centered around um, increasing the level of patient care. I'm always practicing and teaching that production follows value. And mm -hmm. when I'm consulting for an office, I always recommend laser for the hygiene department to implement. Mm -hmm. And um, because I love the numbers so much, I wanted to ask you for based off of your experience, what is the most added production you've seen a dental office add after implementing the laser? That's a really big question because you have to think about, I mean, if you were to look at it, one hygienist practice, right? Obviously, she's not going to produce in a year as much as the practice with eight hygienists. So um, you'd want to maybe look at a percentage. Um, I don't have that particular number. I can tell you in my experience, I've seen on the low end, an office, let's just go by maybe just talking about number of procedures. So okay, on the yeah. low end of just offering a couple procedures on a daily basis, you know, an office might see an increase in $20,000 in revenue for the year. Um, if you think of an office with a lot of hygienists and they're offering a lot of procedures and maybe they're getting between eight to 10 procedures a year. And let's say that those procedures they are charging 20 or no $50 per procedure. They may see up to $85,000 in revenue, you know, so there can be a big range of the, um, you know, the, the patient care driving that type of revenue, because we're offering a higher level of care. Patients may be paying a portion of that as a co-payment. Um, so that can expand that revenue from that hygiene department. Um, I would say 20,000 to even up to a hundred thousand, just depending on the size of your office, how often you're trying to implement laser therapy. And then also think about what state that office may be in, because, some states, the hygienist can use it for one thing. That's it. Other states, the hygienist can use it for five different things. So um, there's a lot of variety out there to what we can do and what the individual practice outcome may be. That was a great answer. Th 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 uh, thank you, Kristen. I think like you really did answer my question there uh, because there, the potential, the earning potential for the practice with the laser is really unpredictable. But there would, as long as they're talking about laser and implementing it, they would always see a return on their investment. Correct. And it's, in my opinion, like the best care we could give our patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. So what advice would you give a hygienist who wants a laser, but maybe the doctor or the practice just isn't ready to invest in a laser, what would you give, what would you tell that hygienist as like leverage to encourage that practice owner? 
kind of depends on why the practice owner doesn't want to implement that type of therapy. So um, is it because they don't want to spend the money? Maybe there's a high turnover rate of hygienists and there's, you know, the one hygienist who wants it, but they're like not wanting to invest when they have staff that's kind of coming and going. So I'd really want to, you know, ask that hygienist, why does the practice owner not want to invest? Um, what is that specific reason? And then you can approach it um, from any angle. You know, is it that they don't, they say that there isn't research. We'll go out there and collect that evidence-based research because in dentistry, we want to base things off of what we know has worked. Um, if it's cost, uh, you could lay out that cost structure of, you know, that doctor, this is what it looks like to buy this type of a unit. And if I was able to diagnose more scalings or we were able to implement more procedures and get a co-payment, we could increase our revenue. So it really would depend on that specific uh, practice owner's reasons behind why they wouldn't want to kind of expand their practice and elevate their patient care. Yeah. Either way, I would say it sounds like you're saying like, do your research. Like if your boss or your, your doctor is just like hesitant to make that financial investment, maybe don't recommend the latest, greatest, highest expensive CO2 laser. But I know there's, there's quite a few on the market that are focused just on hygiene and they're, I think, very reasonable. Um, but definitely that cost analysis and probably the same if they're really just like, skeptical of the clinical benefits, um, approaching them with the research that backs the clinical outcomes that patients have with perio and lasers. Okay. I love that. Kristen, it has been so in insightful speaking with you tonight. Um, there are two questions, Amanda, and I love to end the shows with. And I'll ask the first one. So what do you wish you would have learned in school that took you years to learn in practice? Oh, my gosh. I feel like I'm always learning. Like, even like like last year, I'm like, oh, I wish I knew that, you know. So I feel <laughs> like we're always learning. And, like, school isn't meant to teach you everything. It's just mm -hmm. meant to make you safe so you can go out there and start your career as a hygienist and, and then – you develop and you grow every single year as a clinician and you learn new things. And um, so there wasn't anything that they could have taught me um, because we're just always learning and growing and learning everything all the time. That's, that's incredibly true. I always say like school, just it's there to help you pass boards and well, then you grow from there. I, you know, my first year of hygiene, there was one thing that I felt like they didn't teach me was with like my universal, like I, after I got out of hygiene school, there was a hygienist I worked with and it was the first office and that's where I kind of started with lasers and she taught me a few things instrumentation wise that didn't click in school. And I was like, when I got out, I'm like, oh, why didn't they teach me that? So, <laughs> and so some of these things I learned from other hygienists as well, I think like we're our best resources for learning and showing each other things. That's very true. And I think that's one of the reasons like mentorship or having a healthy work environment is, is so important that you can be that vulnerable student and ask questions that you're like, I don't, I don't remember yeah. learning this in school. Mm hmm Exactly. It's so like important that when they get out of school, like when you're the one who's been there longer, that you just kind of nurture that new hygienist and, um, and help them grow themselves. Well, the other question that we have is what piece of advice do you wish you could go back and give yourself as a new grad? Oh, um, what do I want to... Um, don't be afraid to go to an office or ask for what you want clinically. You know, you want to like, cause I feel like sometimes I've talked to hygienists who may work in an office where they're a little limited, like, no, you're not, we don't want you doing that. Or, um, I've seen it taking blood pressure. I've had hygienist friends who are like, my doctor didn't want me to do blood pressure in the, you know, just keeping the standard of care and going with practices that align with like 
your values and how you want to treat patients and don't go somewhere where you feel like you're doing disservices to, to your, your, the patient base that you treat and you're with. Yeah. No, those are so going after what you want and aligning yourself with the practices that fit your values. Yeah. Not being afraid to say no to a practice if it's just not going to be the right fit. Yeah. <laughs> well, are there any other topics or things that you would like to add to the podcast or things that um, we didn't talk about? Oh, um, gosh, what do you guys think are hot topics right now in dentistry? You mentioned lasers, kind of that's why we're here tonight. But what do you guys see on your side as far as like hygienists wanting information? What's kind of new and relevant? Joffrey, what do you think? What is your what is your thumb on the pulse right now? You know, I, I, I am so Kristen, I do presentations for hygiene students. And at the end, we, I open it to like a Q and a session. And one of the questions was like aimed at the fact of like, how do I avoid burnout and still be like a great employee? Right? Like, how do I win the office over without killing myself? Yeah, And I'm like, I see what you're saying. Like you're going from four hours as a student with a patient and now you're going to have eight in the full day if you're single column. And I mean, I was honestly like talking about um, having good ergonomics, taking it back to the basics, just ensuring you're sitting correctly, adapting to the tooth correctly, like having the proper form on your hand. Like if you don't want to burn yourself out, you have to master those basic skills. Otherwise it's going to be very problematic for you later on. Yeah. That's a really good point. Not bending over. I'm sitting on my saddle stool right now. Uh, (laughs) You know, like I love my saddle stool. I sit up straight because of this stool. And like, you're right. Having those concepts early and practicing your ergonomics, because when you first start, it's so easy to just bend and twist you know, then sometimes practicing your indirect vision. So yeah, keeping those, those ergonomics and and everything that's really important to avoid burnout. One of the, the fun things that we do, we go to um, the annual conferences here in Utah and um, we want to know, you know, what are topics for podcasts that people want to hear? So we do like drawings um, to entice people to yeah. give us that information. And burnout has definitely been a huge topic. Um, lasers are a huge topic still um, because our law here in Utah is pretty ambiguous about what hygienists can and cannot do. Right. Um, so I don't want to say it's the Wild West, but people are just like, what, what can I do? Um, there's a lot of people that want to know about Botox. That's kind of the, yes. like a new buzzword. And then I think a lot of people like the salivary testing and, um, I think there's some, there's definitely some holistic ones that are kind of creeping in there. Yeah. Oh, and ironically, um, people still are confused with staging and grading. Yeah. Oh, I, I see that because we, we talk about that during our training just because we want to hammer home. Like it is important that we, we use that because that's our standard of care right now. And also, you know, insurance um, claims are getting denied and downgraded if you're not using that staging and grading format. They're going to use that as a reason why now you're not going to get, um, you know, reimbursement on your claim. So the staging grading is important to understand. And um, I had to listen to a few CEs on that to, to kind of take that in. And I would have my staging and grading paperwork um, next to my computer at the office. And I would do my little, you know, math problem dividing to try to, you know, figure out the percentage. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it is, it, it's more complicated than what we're used to. <laughs> if you've been a hygienist for a long time. Yeah. I have a a little cheat card and I haven't had to use it in a while, but like the first month I had it out when I was doing notes, I was like, okay, visually, what, what was it? What is this? Mm -hmm. So it it took some adjustments. So that's not surprising, but well, anything else you want to add Joffrey or Kristen? No, I mean, um, well, thank you ladies for having me. I super appreciate it. 
keep me in mind if you ever need anything that um, has to do with lasers or dental education. Um, I'll be in Utah in June. If you guys want to get together, I'll be there the third week. And so maybe we can connect uh, next year. That would yes. be awesome. Um, it's already on my calendar that you're coming in June. It is. And awesome. I would love to take you to my sister's taco restaurant. So yes. oh my gosh, I love tacos. Like it's I'm from Arizona. I was born and raised on Mexican food. So <laughs> it's so good. It is so good. Awesome. All right. Well, it is set then. We will meet up in June. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> Have a great night. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.